Good afternoon, friends. Myself, Dr. Niranjan Agarwal, a colorectal surgeon from Bombay Hospital Institute of Medical Sciences. It is indeed my proud privilege as president of the ACRSI to moderate this session to be addressed by my own mentor and a very close friend, Dr. Parvesh Sheikh. I must thank the ASI and the Healthium to give me this opportunity today. Friends, it is said that if you haven't seen enough complications, you haven't operated enough, or otherwise you are lying. Complications are part and parcel of every surgery, more so of surgeries of the anorectum, especially when they are not performed appropriately. The acute problems such as pain, bleeding, or the chronic problem, urinary retention, or the chronic problems such as uh, incontinence recurrences, they play the uh, anorectal surgeries if uh, inappropriately performed. If the surgeries are performed appropriately, even the latest gadget uh, which are available such as lasers or wafts, etc. If they are rationally used, then it has been noticed that the complications are much less. These complications have significant effect on the quality of life of the patient and since they, get, uh, they are affecting a private part which there is a stigma attached. Many of these patients, in fact, try to avoid these surgeries and they fall prey to the quack. I take proud in introducing today my friend, Dr. Parvesh Sheikh, who has been instrumental in alleviating the fears of a general surgeon while performing these surgeries and preventing this complication and teaching them how to manage. We have before us today the past president of the ACRSI, the past president of the Asia Pacific Federation of Colopathology, a past vice president of the International College of uh, International College University of Cologne and rectal surgeon, and a mentor to many, and the glamour which is much required in any proctology conference, and that is Dr. Parvesh. He is a professor attached to Safi Hospital, Mumbai and is a course director for many uh, training courses in pathology such as Chemist. With this few words, I pass on uh, the baton to Dr. Parvesh Sheikh to enlighten us on how to prevent the complication and manage them during the anorectal surgery. Dr. Parvesh Sheikh. Thank you, Niranjan, for your kind words. I would like to thank ASI at the outset for holding the CME. As I understand, the CME essentially is for postgraduates and also for young surgeons. So today's topic is going to be prevention and management of complications after anorectal surgery. Anorectal surgery comprises almost 30% of all general surgeries and hence is a very common surgery. We, today I hope to uh, ask you all or rather inform you all about the complications that can be expected after the surgery and how to prevent it. In fact, most of the complications are preventable and hence it's very important to know how to prevent this. So let's start with our topic for the day. What I've enumerated here are the common post-op complications. We do have uh, procedure specific complications and that's a very big chapter by itself. And hence our today's discussion will not cover actually specific uh, procedure specific complications. But what I'm going to talk today about is the general complications where you can expect after any anorectal surgery. So let's start uh, with the uh, complications that we see and the pain, bleeding. Pain and bleeding are the most common complications after any anal surgery. Others are urinary retention, anal stenosis, anal incontinence, and sepsis, both local and systemic. So we'll see how we can tackle one of each of this. As I said, the pain and bleeding are the most common ones. So I will spend a little more time as far as uh, these two complications are concerned. Now let's start with bleeding first. The most common complication that we see after anal surgery is bleeding. The bleeding is of two types, early and delayed. What do you mean by early bleeding? Early bleeding means the bleeding which occurs within 24 to 48 hours after the surgery. And the most common cause of this is uh, because of slippage of the vascular pedicle 
that is either if you have tied the pedicle that has slipped off or some blood vessels water has opened up uh, uh, which had stopped during surgery has opened up in the post operative period and uh, or there can be a minor ooze which takes place some maybe during surgery the bp was low and the bp has shot up for any reason and some uh, mild bleeder has opened up or uh, ooze has been there so what you should do to prevent this the first and the foremost uh, uh, step is to ensure a good hemostasis of the table itself that means at the end of the surgery you should make sure that your operative field is quite dry don't expect to just pack it and wait and just do a prayer and say hope it will stop no that's not the thing anal surgery anal area is very accessible and it can easily be controlled so if you feel there is a small bleeder either you can like it that or cauterize that or uh, whatever you want to do to stop that you should stop it on the table at the end of the surgery your operative field should be very clean so you have a opportunity to control the bleeding here itself so don't wait that we'll pack and see and it will stop no you do it at there so i'm just going to show you this video can you see this spotter there this is after a miph procedure and uh, you can see there's a staple line right here that's a staple line here and uh, what we are doing is basically controlling the taking a figure of eight stitch to control the bleeding so any bleeder you see like this it needs to be controlled there so at the end of the surgery your field should be very dry and this way you can sleep peacefully uh, in the night your patient sleeps peacefully nobody has any major uh, bleeding and uh, you can see that it's very dry now so you should have a field uh, like this after the at the end of surgery so in the early bleeding what do you do you, you do the surgery you find that in the evening or maybe next day morning patient has some bleeding uh if it's a minor bleed it's just a ooze you can just pack it now how do you find out that it's essentially is essential to put a proctoscope inside to see because the bleeding can occur and remain the blood can remain inside and get a clot inside and it may not be visible from outside so unless you have a small wick or something uh, put in the anal canal through which the blood can come out if not if you have not packed and normally we don't pack wool pack the anal canal as such then you can put it if you suspect some oozing they put in a proctoscope inside maybe a small size proctoscope lubricated well with lignocaine jelly and see inside whether there are any clots or anything are there if it's just a minor ooze you can just give a wash there and maybe pack it with a hemostatic agent there are many local hemostatic agents available uh, the simple thing you can do is take a what which is easily available is take a ampule of adrenaline take 100 cc of saline put that ampule of adrenaline in that and soak a gauze and just pack the anal canal with that that's a very simple thing which you can do and it's a small oozing it works uh, quite okay but if you find that the bleeding is quite major in the sense you have the patient is there are patient is passing clots and you can actually uh, see a spotter uh, in the post operative period it may be difficult to just do it to control this in the ward Uh, because of the uh, if you have just operated it will be a painful area in which case i think it's better to take the patient to the operation theater and under some sort of anesthesia you can actually identify the uh, bleeder or the spotter which is there and then you may either underrun or cauterize it and uh, don't delay doing that because if you delay too much and the patient has got a lot of blood then you may need to uh supplement uh, with iv fluids and blood transfusions or pack cells or some may have to be given so for the for the young residents i wish i want to tell you that whenever any anal surgery is done in the evening you need to take a round not only ask the patient about how he is whether he's pass urine or not of course those also have to be asked but you should also inspect the anal area just separate the buttocks and see how is the gauze whether it's stained with blood not blood or the bleeding is there so always check that and you can control the bleeding right at the initial stage itself as far as the delayed bleeding is concerned delayed bleeding is the bleeding which occurs almost up to 2 weeks after surgery usually the bleeding uh, occurs the delayed bleeding occurs within 2 weeks it's very rare to find bleeding occurring after 2 weeks unless there's some specific cause for that 
so this delayed bleeding is because of what is most commonly uh, it is thought to be because of a secondary infection a local infection or a local trauma of uh, say patient passing a very hard stool a patient has strained or even uh, nacid nacids which are given as post operative medications uh, can cause this uh blood thinners a lot of patients who are on uh, blood thinners and more and more now we see patients on blood thinners now anticoagulants and antiplatelets uh if patient is on that on those drugs and they can also precipitate this uh, delayed bleeding so it's usually diffuse it's very because it's not like a spotter which is there so it's very difficult to find out uh, a particular point usually that is diffuse uh, so you can treat it by giving antibiotics again you can pack it with a hemostatic solution uh, you can give systematic uh, systemic uh, like a tamsulate you can give you a systemic uh, hemostatic uh, agent you can give uh, rule out whether patient is on anticoagulants or anti uh, blood thinners and you may need to temporarily stop that if it's if the cardiologist allows it uh, do a coagulation profile look for a bleeding disorder if any bleeding disorder is they need to correct that and in spite of all your efforts patient still continues to bleed you need to take the patient to the operation theater and at this stage is very difficult to take a stitch because it's already more than a week and the your sutures may cut through so you may just cauterize the bleeders that you see and usually that uh, stops the bleeding so that's how we tackle the delayed bleeding now coming to the next complication which is pain uh pain is one of the most dreaded complications which the patient fears and hence many of these patients do not actually come to the surgeon but they go to this quacks or there are so many roadside uh, clinics happening and in our country especially and there these patients go because those people promise the patient uh, they are rather they advertise that they do a painless job whatever they do whether legal or illegal so if we can reduce this pain then we can have more patients coming to us for surgery and at least getting a proper treatment by surgeons so let's see how we can prevent this pain there are many things which you can do to prevent this uh let's take it one by one first as i mentioned is if you are suturing like if you are doing a specially hemorrhagectomy a close hemorrhagectomy and trying to suture or any wound after fistulectomy you are trying to suture do not suture in a tension if you think that the two edges cannot come together then don't suture it because it will cause more pain that's one of the major causes of pain if you have tried to very tightly suture two ends together under tension so that's one thing second thing is try to leave less raw areas if you have a anal wound uh, you one thing is you can marsupialize to decrease the size of the wound or you can partially close the wound uh, uh, so all if there are less raw areas exposed the pain is going to be less so that's the second thing third thing is that if you have wounds which have got a depth then post of packing and removing the pack is more painful packing is not so painful but removing the pack is very painful so if you can make the wounds flat say abscess cavity if you can excise the fibrous wall of the abscess <coughs> then the wound becomes quite flat and if you don't have to pack the wound it's very easy in the post operative period to uh, keep this patient's uh, pain free one thing which i have started doing now almost since one last one decade and a lot of people uh, in our country in india have started doing this now after i started i introduced this here uh, what i did was uh, this is i learned from some of the asian surgeons actually uh, is to inject take a solution of uh, 5 cc of 0.25 bupivacaine if you don't have 0.25 you can take about 0.5 bupivacaine and add 1 cc of methylene blue which is available in a ampule form uh, so total 6 cc this i inject at the sites where you think that it's going to be painful for example if you have done a hemorrhagectomy a close hemorrhagectomy you would inject it into the anoderm into the mucosa and into the surrounding skin whichever is involved in the surgery if you have done a pph or miph procedure you would inject underneath the staple line if you have done a fistulectomy uh, and uh, if you have done a specially if you have done a repair repair the muscles the, the edges of the muscle and the mucosa you can inject so wherever whichever part you think is going to cause pain if you inject now it has been found that this methane blue uh, gives pain relief 
for almost three weeks. But practically, we see for the at least for the first three to five days, patient has very little pain. So it's very good in the immediate post surgery period to relieve this uh, pain. And this is now a matter of routine, which I do to all my patients. And it really makes a lot of difference. And you can try that. So these are the things. And if you think that this patient, in spite of all this patient has, is going to have a lot of pain or the patient is very sensitive or patient says, I don't want any pain, then prophylactically the anesthetist puts epidural or you can do the surgery into epidural, keep the catheter and use that to uh, uh, give uh, pain relief to the patient by epidural pump or epidural regular injection to the epidural. Uh, the common one of the common surgeries is hemorrhoidectomy. There's always a controversy whether we should do close and open. As I said, if you have less wounds, then the pain is less. And it is found that if you were to do a close hemorrhoidectomy, there would be less pain as compared to the open hemorrhoidectomy. Uh, not only less pain, but less bleeding also if you suture it. Obviously, if you're suturing the ends together, you're going to get less pain. Of course, there are so many other, other the modalities of surgery are coming where uh, the pain is much less and less invasive surgeries. So other things what you can do in the post-operative period, see that the patient doesn't pass heart stools because if the patient pass heart stools, he or she is likely to have a lot of pain. So you can give some mild laxative like lactulose or lactitol in the post-operative period. And even in the pre-operative period, make sure that the patient doesn't have heart stools. So you can give a laxative even one night before so that all the rectum or the anal canal has got emptied out and there are no heart stools there. So that will help in uh, patient passing smooth uh, or soft stools after surgery and helps and hence decrease the pain after surgery. Avoid anal packing. You can just, if you want, you can just put a small wick in the anal canal to just see for bleeding if it occurs and that, that wick acts like a drain for the uh, blood to come out. But we don't advise tight anal packing because it's very painful and because of pain, patient can get even urinary retention. So it's not recommended. The packing was done basically for hemostasis. But as I said earlier, if you do a good hemostasis on the table, then you don't need to do anal packing. Do not use anal dilators in the post-operative period as a routine. There is no surgery which needs post-operative, the use of post-operative dilators. You do a proper surgery so you don't get a anal stenosis. Dilators is not a substitute for improper surgery. So you should do the surgery well and hence you may not need to use dilators at all. And of course, lastly, make sure that there is no pre-existing sepsis. Now, by pre-existing, I don't mean an anal perianal abscess. Abscess, of course, has got pus. <clears throat> I mean proctitis. Rule out that there is no proctitis. Okay. So make sure that there is no inflammation of the anal or the rectal mucosa, no active disease. Uh, and then, if you do that, then uh, if you have these are mostly are these are elective surgeries. If you think there is an active infection, treat that first and then do the surgeries. So what is the treatment for that? Basically, uh, pain, of course, all of us routinely use a, a analgesics, oral analgesics uh, in the post-operative period. If there is a spasm, you can also use some muscle relaxants, both local muscle relaxants like diltiazem or nifedipine or uh, immense or oral muscle relaxants can be used. Uh, you can, I normally use a lot of uh, anesthetic agents like uh, bupivacaine in my post-operative dressings. So if I have a fistula wound who comes to me for dressing, I would uh, pack the wound or uh, sort of close the wound or cover the wound with a solution of bupivacaine and maybe uh, povidone iodine if you wish to. So that immediately in the post-operative period, the pain or after dressing, the pain reduces considerably and the patient is very happy and look, looks forward to the dressing. Metrogel gel uh, used locally in the post-operative period is supposed to have uh, reducing pain probably by reducing uh, uh, infection, local infection, if any. That's a very uh, sort of mild evidence for that. Cis path, now cis path is uh, very, very widely used by everybody and anybody. Cis bath, the role of cis bath is basically that warm water in the sitz bath gives rise to a sort of a, has an effect of a hot water fermentation and patient feels better. 
So that does reduce the pain, but make sure you don't add any chemicals to it and certainly not potassium permanganate. I've seen enough and more patients with potassium permanganate burns. So do not use this. This is an obsolete product which should never be used in a sits path. No Detol or Savlon or Betadine in the sits path. That's not going to help. Just mechanical washing with a hand shower or, or a similar device can also is good enough. I ask the patient to use that. But if you're, if you're asking the patient for us to have a sits path, just once a day after passing stools, patient sits, so mechanically it washes the wound. The hot water gives some relief. And that's it. There's no further role of sits path. But it does help in the pain relief to a certain extent. The other complication that we see is, especially after anal surgery, is urinary retention. Now, how do you prevent a urinary retention? Uh, first of all, make sure that the patient comes to the operation theater on an empty bladder. So make the patient pass urine so that at least his bladder is empty. The factors which cause urinary retention are basically spinal anesthesia, the fluid overload to the patient, or a post-operative pain which is severe, especially an anal pack or a tight anal pack can cause this. So if you avoid all these three things, then you can prevent a urinary retention. Instead of spinal anesthesia, if one uses local anesthesia, I do almost all my cases under local anesthesia. Uh, local anesthesia has got the advantage of not requiring IV fluids, so there's no fluid overload. As I said, you use bupivacaine, which gives good post-op pain relief. And if you use methylene blue along with that, for the first two, three days, there's hardly any pain. So it takes care of the pain, takes care of the uh, uh, fluid overload. And also the spinal anesthesia itself can cause urinary retention. So that also is avoided. So local anesthesia is certainly one factor which you can uh, use to uh, not only to cause less post-operative pain, but also prevent uh, urinary retention from happening. You can mobilize this, especially if you're doing under local anesthesia, you can mobilize these patients early. Uh, you can give analgesics if the patient is having anal pain, the use of analgesics will help in reducing the pain and hence the uh, patient will be help in the patient passing urine. Uh, if in a male patient, if the patient has got a prostatic enlargement, uh, or patient has got history of uh, prostatic uh, obstructive symptoms, then you can use appropriate drugs for the enlarged prostate. And if nothing else works, you can give a trial of urinary catheter. You can put the catheter, remove it. But after removing if the patient again cannot pass, then maybe taking a urological reference and keeping the catheter for a few days may help. The next coming to anal stenosis. Now, anal stenosis is specific to hemorrhoidectomy. Uh, it's usually following excision of multiple hemorrhoids. Uh, it's an entirely preventable complication. And if a patient develops anal stenosis after hemorrhoidectomy, it means that the surgical technique was faulty. So it occurs if you excise too much of the mucosa and the anoderm. Uh, and if you don't do that, then you can prevent it, of course. Even if you have to excise all the three hemorrhoids by hemorrhoidectomy, you can easily prevent an anal stenosis from happening. Uh, make sure that when you excise the hemorrhoids, between the two hemorrhoids, there's enough, uh, uh, enough mucosa and anoderm should be preserved between the two excised, between the adjacent excised uh, hemorrhoids. So you can see that uh, you have the skin, you have the anoderm, and you have this dentate line here. So between the dentate line and the skin is the anoderm. This is the part which you should not excise more. So you can excise the, uh, the anal uh, uh, mucosa. The mucosa you can excise because the pile basically has redundant mucosa. You can excise the external pile at the skin. But this part you should not excise. So you can just take a very little excision. So you can have a dumbbell shape incision like this and like this. And here the excision should be very narrow. So if you do this, then you can prevent anal stenosis from taking place. And also the pain will be much less if you preserve the anoderm and don't excise too much of the anoderm. So the treatment of anal stenosis, if it's a mild stenosis, patient has mild symptoms and you can put your finger, your finger goes in easily. 
there maybe you can use anal dilators to sort of dilate it and keep it dilated basically at the early stage but if it's a very severe anal stenosis then you will need some sort of plastic surgery like an anal flap or an anoplasty for that when you have a patient with anal stenosis dilatation or stretching is not the treatment stretching is just temporary it can give the patient some relief for four or five days but again when it starts with stenosis again patient is back to square one so anal stretching is not the treatment uh, for anal stenosis you can see this is a very tight uh, anal stenosis it can you, you cannot even put your little finger inside maybe just the tip of the hemostasis hemostat uh, forceps can go inside and that's it's very narrow so what you can do is you can take an incision here first posteriorly open up this stenosis the stenosis is usually at a level of the uh, uh, mucosa and submucosa not below that and then you can raise a flap you can see this is one method where i've raised the mucosal and the skin flaps and then suture it so you can see the speculum has very nicely gone uh, been introduced it's a very wide uh, opening and if you are suturing it primarily you can prevent uh, uh, restenosis from taking place so there are various types of flaps which can be used this is just one of them incontinence again uh, the most common cause is uh, destruction or destroying the or damage the damaging the anal sphincters you can have a sensory incontinence where in a white hat procedure you have actually excised almost the entire anoderm circumferentially if you have done that if you have excised everything then the sensory part of the anoderm and the sensory area that is the dentate line and the area just above it if you have excised all that uh, that's a very highly sensitive area and that is very necessary for continence so that if that is excised that patient doesn't have that sensation which we normally have of passing stools and after this procedure that may get impaired especially if you have done a circumferential excision but more common than that is the uh, incontinence caused by damage to the anal sphincters now anal dilatation which is which is very common when i was a student we used to do anal dilatation now every society every colorectal society across the world has given up this or recommended that it should not be done for any anal surgery whether it is uh, hemorrhoids or whether it is fissure or whether it is fistula anal dilatation is not the procedure which should be done anal dilatation causes a diffuse tear of the sphincters if you get incontinence after anal dilatation it's very difficult to treat because it's not damage at one particular segment it's a very diffuse treatment diffuse uh, injury so the treatment becomes very difficult and most of these patients have to continue their life with some sort of incontinence as far as fistulectomy is concerned uh, when you are doing fistulectomy if you are actually cutting the sphincters below the dentate line at a low level you don't need to worry about incontinence that doesn't cause but if you cut between the anorectal ring and that and the uh, dentate line that part that is the between the deep and the superficial part of the external sphincter you can expect some sort of minor incontinence but if you were to cut dissect or rather incise the anorectal ring completely at this level at the level of the anorectal ring if you were to cut that then patient would have incontinence to solid stools which is not acceptable so how do you prevent that when you are doing a fistula surgery keep on palpating the anorectal ring making sure that you are not cutting it so if your anorectal ring is intact there is usually no gross incontinence so how do you manage that most of the incontinence we see after surgery is usually mild and they are usually uh, well managed by anal sphincter exercises and some uh, stimulation of the anal sphincter muscles as them to adjust the diet any any anything food in any part or any food item which causes loose motion for that patient may need to be stopped uh, some people also use uh, constipating agents or uh, maybe fiber because fiber causes bulk and uh, all the stool comes out at one time and you know if patient doesn't have to go every now and then so these are some things and patient continues with his exercises and most of the patients improve with this but if the patient has gross incontinence patient is soiling and patient like is uh, sort of almost using a diaper and it's uh, home uh, 
confined because of his problem, then of course something needs to be done. If it's a fistulectomy, as I said, then you can go back and repair that sphincter. If the sphincter has been cut in a particular segment, you can go back and repair it and get very good continence uh, doing that. Uh, of course, it depends on how soon after surgery you do this. You can also, in addition, supplement this with either a gracilis muscle transposition or a gluteus muscle transposition, which actually gives good bulk and helps in closing the anal canal, keeping the anal canal closed. Also, you have sacral nerve stimulation, which can be done, uh, especially if you cannot, you don't have any other options left, and sacral nerve stimulation is one. Of course, that's a incontinence is a big chapter by itself, but this is, in brief, this is what you can do but the main thing is to prevent uh, incontinence happening after surgery and which is always preventable lastly the sepsis is concerned as i said that you should make sure that there is no active uh, sepsis in the mucosa uh, before surgery if there is then you treat that first and then do the surgery uh, as far as antibiotics is concerned uh, i normally use a single dose prophylaxis and that's what is recommended by most people most guidelines rather. Uh, post job antibiotics actually is not necessary. Surprisingly, the anal wounds, even though the stool passes from there, do not get infected. Post job antibiotics can be used if you have already a pre existing systemic sepsis, like a bad fistula with sepsis, then of course you need post job antibiotics. If the patient is immunocompromised, patient is diabetic, or patient has. Uh, uh, cardiac valves, uh, synthetic cardiac valves, and so on and so forth. So these are the uh, conditions where you would give post-sub antibiotics uh, as, um, as required. Uh, sepsis occurring in the post-operative period uh, can be treated with uh, antibiotics. You need to drain the sepsis. Rarely, they can be very bad sepsis extending up to the uh, retroperitoneal and preperitoneal areas. And those really require admission and maybe intensive care with deprivement and things like that. So although sepsis is not so common, it can occur. And uh, it is, again, preventable if you just take these simple steps. And uh, as I said, severe infection can lead to gram-negative septicemia, which is a serious condition. So these are the common complications that one can expect after surgery. And... Uh, to summarize, as I said, anal surgeries are one of the most common surgeries which are done in our country. Uh, and thus, we should know how to do those surgeries properly because most of the complications are preventable. Uh, and if you prevent these complications, they can make anal surgery comfortable for the patient as well as you as a surgeon. And can also help in patients getting back to work early. That's what the patient is looking for. Uh, surgery with very less pain, getting back to work early, so now a lot of new techniques have come which can help you do that and you should try to adopt those techniques whenever possible. Most complications uh, can be treated very easily and uh, there are very rare instances where you may need to call or take a help of an experienced colleague to help you deal with these complications. Two heads are always better than one and there's no harm in doing that. So with this, uh, I would like to thank ASI for organizing this CME for our young surgeons and PGs. And uh, though it was a self-explanatory, there are certain questions in the mind of few of the uh, delegates who have logged in. And uh, may I have your permission to ask you those questions? And uh, can I start with the first one? Sure, sure, Niranjan, go ahead. Okay. So you mentioned about use of methylene blue in uh, combination with uh, sensor cane. So how does it work actually? Uh, Dr. Tagore Gandhi wants to know how does methylene blue work? So methylene blue basically paralyzes the nerve, temporarily paralyzes the nerve endings. Uh, and this, uh, what we see clinically is that uh, because the peripheral nerve endings are paralyzed, the pain uh, sensations are reduced there and hence we get pain relief. Now, the pain relief which we see usually is in the first uh, three to five days, the patient has very minimal pain. And as you know that this is the most painful period for the patient. The first 48 to 72 hours are the most painful period. So that period is covered. Of course, the patient passes green urine because this methylene blue gets uh, secreted in the urine. So the urine color changes to green. So the patient needs to be warned that, uh, you know, they pass green color urine and also 
there are some contraindications to mifepristone do like uh, patient on mao inhibitors uh, patients with g6pd deficiency so normally we would test for a g6pd before we uh, would inject so you do it in all patients g6pd in all the patient because you are yeah. giving it in all the patient ideally speaking yes but especially like there are some communities which have more uh, have more incidence of g6pd like uh, arabs or the parsi community so in those patients at least we do a routinely <clears throat> other patients we may not do and uh, also that uh, the dose we inject is just 1 cc of methylene blue ethyl is diluted uh, in my hospital also some people have started diluting even more like i take 5 cc and 1 cc they have started taking 10 cc and 1 cc and they have also found it effective so we have done a study where we have done a, a, a controlled trial where we have shown that methylene blue reduces pain much more than just with bupivacaine and now probably the next study would be to see the what is the optimum dose of this to be injected but not only in anal surgery okay. now methylene blue has been widely used in other surgeries also at least in my hospital gynecologists have started using it laparoscopic surgeons have started using it so it does give a lot of pain relief Right. So you said the temporary paralysis the nerve ending. So does that mean there is some kind of incontinence because of the muscle paralysis associated, or you don't, or any other complication you see with this use? No other complications. But I would not inject. I would not give a nerve block in the sense means I would not give a parietal block with this methylene blue. I would just inject it in the peripheral. The so peripheral, if you're just injecting into the area of surgery wherever you've operated, only there. It's not circumferential block. Is not given only in that area of surgery, so that doesn't give rise to incontinence. In fact, that prevents the spasm because there is no pain, so the spasm also is prevented post-operative spasm. Okay, so you mean to say even surface application would work in that case if it is just given yes. below? Yes, actually, I've uh, I've also got uh, feedback from some surgeons where they actually spray on the anal wound, uh, on the post-operative wound, and they said they get excellent. Uh, a pain relief just by spraying it you know so the okay, so even that is also possible yes. and uh, how do uh, you already said okay, where all you injected you injected circumferentially or only at the site of the wound no only at the site of surgery only at the site of the surgery okay uh, another question uh, you did mention about metronidazole for pain relief what is your take on uh, application of uh, local sucralfate now the market is flooded with a combination of metrogel sucralfate and lignocaine are all three working only one is lignocaine is working which is proved or and can I it think, be uh, sucralfate also sucralfate by covering the wound does give some uh, relief i personally do not have much experience by it uh, with it but uh, uh, i think you could use this drugs but they are only for short term use not for a long term use so it, it can be used in all anorectal surgeries or only particularly to hemorrhoids or something no no all anorectal surgeries you can use it Maybe for a week or ten days, you could use this. After this, the pain is anyway less. And after a week or ten days, then I shift over to just plain lignocaine. If the patient has pain, I just use plain lignocaine jelly. Uh, even after, even another thing which I probably did not mention, I forgot to mention, was that you can, when the patient in the post-operative period, ask the patients to use uh, lignocaine jelly to apply it intraanally, wait for five minutes, and pass stool. So the Passage. The How do you apply intraanally? Because uh, the post-operative, if you try to put in your finger, the patient may hurt himself. Not really. But the jelly needs to be applied just maybe a centimeter inside the anal okay. canal. So just the anoderm and that part is covered up. That's good enough. So you, with the uh, the patient can uh, apply finger uh, with a finger apply the jelly inside uh, the anal canal. Just little inside the anal canal. Wait for five minutes. That anesthetize the anal canal. So the act of passing the stool. act of defecation becomes relatively painless uh, with this uh, simple thing do you add a sphincterotomy to all your uh, hemorrhoidectomy surgeries open surgery or even mipch or something so sphincterotomy is actually required yeah sphincterotomy okay. is uh, uh, what what you are trying to ask niranjan is whether sphincterotomy should be routine should be done to prevent yeah. a spasm from happening in the post operative period but there is no role for sphincterotomy just for relieving the spasm So, yeah. if the patient has a fissure, and uh, uh, along with say only if you are operating only for fissure, of course you would do spectroscopy. But if you have fissure with piles, in which case you need to decide that in your outpatient whether this patient has got a spasm and also needs a spectroscopy. So you would do it at that. But it is not done as a routine. 
for <laughs> to relieve post operative uh, pain not, not even anal dilatation for that matter not because even anal dilatation people still keep on you know you, even senior people keep on doing dilatation prior to going ahead with a spring uh, hemorrhage surgery now what is your uh, protocol for an antibiotics so as i said antibiotic uh, one dose of antibiotic is uh, usually prophylaxis one dose prophylaxis is usually enough and we don't need to actually use antibiotics in the post operative period for the only reason is that uh, there is no evidence to say that it is effective in the post operative period so hence yeah, yeah. complete complete sorry so, uh, only unless we have uh, some uh, indications like patient is having systemic sepsis or patient is a diabetic or immunocompromised or patient is having uh, synthetic cardiac valves all these are indications to use antibiotic in the post operative period but as a matter of routine there is no evidence to suggest that antibiotics in the post operative period help uh, the patient in any way and what analgesics do you routinely use in the post operative period oral analgesics so i normally use uh, diclofenac uh, preparation but i think the choice is uh, i mean you could use a, a, a tramadol or uh, as an anaphylactic drug like tramadol or like one that cause constipation tramadol would be constipating yeah, right so what we do is uh, post op as i mentioned we do use uh, uh, laxatives like a lactilo lactitol or i'll come to that lactilose. about your choice of laxatives yeah. so you can adjust i tell the patient also you remember that the dose of laxative that you give is not the same for all patients it differs to patient to patient so i ask the patient because especially in the post operative period patient is going to get uh, uh, constipated so i tell them to adjust the dose of the laxative so if the tramadol is going to cause constipation they can increase the dose of uh, laxative what uh, what is an ideal laxative for a post operative patient uh, after anorectal surgery according to you so as i said that uh, post operatively these patients are immobilized for some time immobilized means they are walking about and everything but they are not really gone back to their routine work and everything so they put tend to get a little more constipated than they normally would and most of the anal patients patients with anal problems are constipated to start with so they do need some sort of laxative so my choice as i said is uh, lactulose uh, i start normally with uh, 30 ml of lactulose and uh, at night bedtime now also that also depends some people with 30 ml at bedtime they have to rush in the night itself to pass you or to pass tools so in those case patients are as it as they to take it in the morning instead of night so that in the morning itself they evacuate if the 30 ml also they pass hard tools then i ask them to take about 15 ml in the morning and 30 ml at night because the starting point of that stool also should be soft most of the patients say that the initial passage of the stool is hard and then the soft stools follow that and that also causes pain so make sure that the stools are completely soft and the pain is less there's another question is uh, if there is an acute sepsis with a patient with uh, aml so how do you go about it with aml uh, even with a leukemia yeah. uh, now the thing is uh, i work with a uh, with the uh, with the oncologist and lot of uh, this uh, blood uh, malignancies uh, patients are sent to me for surgery uh we need to treat what happens is they when the uh, one one scene is where the patient is on active chemotherapy for the aml usually with the perineal sepsis like uh, abscess or a fistula they are the uh, oncologists are not comfortable in continuing with the chemotherapy unless the sepsis uh, the source of sepsis is treated so usually they they interrupt the therapy they send the patient i offer the patient and maybe a month after surgery the treatment is uh, again the chemotherapy again is resumed so he, when the patient is in aml and on therapy you need to treat the sepsis because the chemotherapy is going to flare up the sepsis yeah sepsis has to be treated uh, it should be a priority now another question is if a patient in the post operative period develops a fecal impaction for various reasons how would you manage this patients with impaction so impaction again usually you should try to prevent it that's why i said you start the patient don't constipate the patient in the post operative period there's no you should actually i start the patient on laxative very soon maybe at the same night or the next day night the patients are started on laxative so they do not constipate if you have if you have constipated the patient and or patient has got a lot of pain and spasm and not able to pass through because of that uh after 48 hours patient should pass so if, if 48 hours patient doesn't pass tools you may use a a sort of a, some suppository or a, 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 a 
on a small enema to sort of uh, uh, evacuate the stools because they just need the stools are there. But if you have waited for too long, say for a week and it's impacted, then it's very difficult to evacuate in the ward and even need to take these patients under anesthesia and evacuate it manually. So, but it's very uh, not very common for this to happen. But by 48 hours, if the patient doesn't pass stool, I think it's a good idea to use a, a suppository, uh, a bisacodyl suppository, or maybe a small a proctoglyphus enema or something like that to just evacuate the stools. Uh, Dr. Sanjay wants to ask you whether methylene blue can be mixed for the pudendal block. So as I said, we don't need we don't need to block the pudendal nerve in the post-operative period because we don't pudendal nerve is basically given to is, is during surgery we give a block pudendal block to relax the muscle because we want the muscle the external sphincter to be relaxed when we operate, but we don't want the external sphincter to be paralyzed in the post-operative period. So uh, there is no I would not recommend. Uh, blocking the pudendal nerve. Another complication once we many a times we see after fistula surgery, especially if it is a midline posterior fistula and you have done a sphincter, you have done a fistulotomy, there is a keyhole deformity which keep on leaking mucus uh, so many times, you know. Yeah. Uh, approximately around 28 to 30 percent of these patients. They keep on having uh, itching as a uh, continuous problem or keep on uh, spoiling their clothes, soiling their clothes. So, what would you recommend for such patients? So, as I said, I didn't discuss uh, uh, surgery-specific uh, complications, but this is one of the things which is commonly described: the keyhole deformity, as Niranjan has mentioned. So, one is that that's why the fissure when we do a sclerotomy, we don't do it posteriorly; it has to be done laterally to prevent that. But if you have a posterior fistula, then obviously you need to excise. So, by default, you have to incise there and cut that. And the way to prevent that would be, uh, first of all, if you take a mucosa, mucosal flap and close that posterior defect, mm -hmm. that can sort of prevent the keyhole deformity from occurring. But if it does happen, and sometimes it is uh, not preventable and it does happen, uh, what happens is basically the stools get stuck there and get lodged there. And the post-op when the patient, uh, after passing stool, is walking about, that stools can get expressed from there or some uh, feet, not actual stools, but just small particles of fecal matter can get expressed from there. So the treatment for that is basically I ask the patients to wash after passing stools. So use a hand shower and wash. Then he goes out. Maybe he walks for five minutes. Again, comes back again and again washes. So the whatever stools are stuck there, they get washed out. And then his patient is uh, like uh, stool free for the rest of the day. So it doesn't doesn't cause him a discomfort. Initial days, you can also ask him maybe at night before he sleeps, he just use a hand shower and wash. That is good enough. So that is a minor thing which can easily be tackled. Uh, Dr. Sule has posted one question. There is a case of severe perianal sepsis having active DVT on anticoagulant therapy. Uh, and he has written DEGAT 150 milligram BD. So I don't know which drug is DGAT. How to proceed? So that needs to be cut. If the patient is having DVT, of course, we can't stop that. Uh, but the sepsis, if the patient is having severe sepsis, you need to treat a sepsis. In fact, all the patients in septicemia are given some sort of uh, prophylaxis to prevent a DVT. But if the patient is already having a DVT, uh, it is not recommended to stop that. Maybe you can switch over to heparin, uh, another uh, uh, group of heparin, which is which doesn't cause so much of bleeding. And uh, you could, uh, like Lexin or something can be shifted over to Lexin. And then we can, you need to operate whatever uh, sepsis if the patient is having uh, like uh, phonius gangrene, you know, a patient is having ascending uh, infection to the abdominal wall causing necrotizing fasciitis. They need to be operated because these patients are in sepsis and they need to be operated and debridement needs to be done. If the patient is too bad, he may not do a primary surgery, but at least take care of the sepsis. And once the patient settles down, then he can go ahead and do a fistula surgery, which causes this. Uh, I think probably course. what he also wants to know is that if the INR is too much deranged and you are uh, feared about the hemorrhage, then the best thing is to do the surgery and the FFP cover and then slowly introduce your anticoagulant again because sepsis is one thing which will kill the patient before the DVT. So you have, to prior, you have to prioritize the treatment and then tackle it. So you cannot leave the sepsis neglected. You have to take all the risk and the safety measures like FFP, administration, etc. Go ahead and then come back to your treatment for this. 
So with this, the, most of the questions, are, uh, practically all the questions are over. In fact, I asked you more questions than the delegates because probably I was not clear and the delegates were very clear about your talk. So thank you, Parvi. Thank you so much for a lucid talk. And I must thank ASI and uh, the Helium for uh, giving us this opportunity to conduct this webinar for all of you. And uh, the next webinar of the ASI uh, this will be on 21st of August. That is a Wednesday again at 3 p.m. Topic being endoscopy for surgeons, why, when, and how. And it will be delivered by none other than Dr. Shubhas Khanna, a very well-known surgeon, senior surgeon from Guwahati. So till then, good afternoon, friends, once again, and take care of yourself while performing your duties in your hospitals. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nirajan, and thank you, ASI, for conducting this CME.